The notion of slave labor in the Western world seems like a point of history to most. But as recently as 15 years ago, women who were cast aside by society were sent to institutions in Ireland run by the church. Those institutions became known as the Magdalen Laundries for the hard, unpaid labor the women endured doing industrial laundry. Today, there is a movement afoot to right those wrongs of the past. Sean Mallon traveled to Ireland to hear the women's stories and in the process uncovered a troubling parallel here in Canada. They say they were the forgotten ones, their names taken away, their freedom denied, their humanity abused. It's a disgrace. Absolutely, the church was a disgrace. Well, you'd wake up sort of maybe three o'clock in the morning uh, screaming because the nuns used to come in and check on you in that time. You always visioned them around your bed, you know, in their dark clothes and not knowing what they're going to do to you. The horror always does with you. It never leaves you. There's a part of your life that is destroyed. Maureen Taylor and Maureen Sullivan call themselves survivors. Survivors of a peculiar institution called the Magdalen Laundries. They did. They did wreck my life. They destroyed it. I, my first uh, marriage, I couldn't cope. I wasn't able to cope. And my husband, he's, he's dead as well. The Lord have mercy on him. He couldn't understand why I'd be waking up in the night. I was ashamed. I had never told anybody I was in the Magdalene Laundries because I felt that you were a bad person. In the Christian tradition, Mary Magdalene was the fallen woman who repented to become among the most faithful followers of Jesus. Starting in the 18th century, orders of nuns throughout Europe opened houses in her name where they tried to convince prostitutes to leave the street. By the 20th century in Ireland, they had a broader mission, taking in unwed mothers and often young women who were simply not wanted by their families. When Maureen Sullivan was only 12 years old, her mother sent her to what was known as an industrial school. This after Sullivan was abused by a family member. But that lovely school turned out to be a Magdalene laundry to do work every day. Instead of an education, every day Sullivan says she was taken down a dark, dank passageway to a building next door and put to work. It was just, you know, it was sticky. Sweaty. It was just horrible. Four orders of Catholic nuns ran the ten laundries around Ireland. The women say the labor was relentless, injuries common. Very heavy work. If you weren't doing the sheets quick enough, they'd come over and hit you a box into the side of the face. I often collapsed. Many a time I collapsed. According to the women, the original mission of saving souls had somehow evolved into a money-making operation built on the backs of unpaid, unwilling laborers who were strictly controlled, as seen in this excerpt from a list of rules published in 1898. They should be obliged to go to the dormitory in silence. We should not allow two children to be alone. I wouldn't be allowed to speak to anybody. I wasn't allowed to tell anybody who I was, tell anybody where I came from. The nuns were very cruel. They were very, they, they were very cruel. They'd uh, come up behind you. If you didn't do the job right, they would just pull you by the hair. One nun pulled me right down to my toes. And what was the offence? Nothing. Just didn't do something that they asked me to do, or maybe I spoke. Maureen Taylor also endured the abuse of a family member. In 1964, her mother put her on a plane home from England, believing that she'd be going to school in Ireland. Instead, the 16-year-old was met by the police at the airport and taken to a place called High Park in Dublin. The shell of the building still stands as a burnt-out ruin. It was late at night and there was um, a nun there to greet me, an elderly nun there to meet me, and um, she brought me into a room 
And the first thing she said, uh, you will not be known as Maureen Taylor. You will be known as Monica for the time that you're here. I ran away a few times and I was um, brought back by members of the police. And what happened to you when you got back? Bad beating. Punished, punished. So this had every appearance of a prison? Yes, yes. Where'd you were? It was, it was bars. Every window had bars. The front door had bars on it. No one knows exactly how many women labored in the laundries. One estimate suggests as many as 30,000. The claims of abuse only started to surface in the 1990s when the nuns who owned the High Park laundry sold part of their land. Where these apartment buildings now stand, a mass grave was discovered, containing the remains of scores of women who worked in the laundry. They were exhumed and moved to another Dublin cemetery. We took Maureen Taylor there for her first view of the gravestones of some of the women she'd known. Do you recognize any of those names? I don't because they were all given religious names and we were never known as your own name, your birth name. Right. And it breaks my heart to see that, to be quite honest with you, you know, because... You knew these women? Uh, I would I would have known them, you know. You and just didn't I, know their names? Yeah, exactly. And, and it, it, it's quite it's quite disturbing. Yeah. You know. Uh, please forgive me. No, no. According to reports, there were 22 more bodies in that mass grave than the nuns had ever recorded. Suddenly, people were starting to ask uncomfortable questions about what went on in those laundries for all those years. It was a very cruel, poor country. Patsy McGarry is the religious affairs correspondent for the Irish Times in Dublin. And these places were found to be profitable. It wasn't as if the money wasn't there to feed and care for these children pro properly, but it wasn't done. Similarly, it was found with uh, uh, the Magdalene Laundry, is now well known, that these women were just eff effectively imprisoned for life for uh, uh, un uncertain offences. Those so-called offences could include having a child out of wedlock. And many young women consigned to the laundries were actually victims of abuse at home and shunned by their families. There is a widespread sense that these women were badly treated, that they have real grounds for grievance, and that whatever should be done for them ought to be done for them. The last laundry only closed in 1996 in Dublin. This is the door, and yes, it does look very much like a prison. Recently, some of the surviving women started setting aside their shame to speak out, encouraged by Stephen O'Reardon, a young documentary maker who was determined to tell their stories. We should acknowledge the fact that we dehumanize these women. Last year, when his documentary, The Forgotten Maggie's, was broadcast, it was, amazingly, the first time a detailed program on the laundries made by an Irishman was ever shown on Irish TV. In the context of the women that went in there, obviously the women that went in there were known as fallen women, whereas the women that I've come across weren't fallen women in any shape or form, and actually the state were the ones that put the women in there in the first instance. I think they have to be honest and say that the state were involved. And I want the Minister for Justice to say that they were involved. Would you like to hear somebody say, I'm sorry? I would, but it's not going to help anyone. No? No. Next on 16 by 9, slave labor in Canada. There was a six foot wooden board, and at night they give you a blanket to cover up and they take it away in the morning. And that's all that was in the, that room. Is the government ignoring victims of abuse? In Ireland, the long untold story of the Magdalen Laundries is slowly making its way into the light. 
be quite honest, I, when I think back on it now, I was just so frightened. The church, that are supposed to have a bit of humanity with people, and this is how they treated women. It's an absolute disgrace. A story of young women who say they were consigned to a life of hard labor and often mistreatment in institutions operated by nuns. Women accused of loose morals, but in truth, often victims of abuse at home. They were like a sanctimonious sweatshop. Professor Linda Mahood of the University of Guelph says the laundries were not just an Irish phenomenon, they were in many countries, including Canada, with taxpayer support. They were sort of seen to be an unofficial branch of the criminal justice system. They were funded by provincial governments to a certain extent. Canada's laundries peaked in Victorian days and were gone by the middle of the 20th century. But we found a woman who'd been through one, and she has a harrowing story to tell. I was in the Good Shepherd Reformatory, and I was born there. Chaparral Bowman is 77 now, but she says she has a clear memory of events in New Brunswick from long ago. This parking lot in St. John is where the Good Shepherd home once stood. It's where her life began, where in the 1930s, her mother, Delcina, a 12-year-old Mi'kmaq girl, was sent after being raped. She was also pregnant after this incident. They took her to the priest on the reserve and asked him what to do. He said, put her in the home. Just the crime of being born in the wrong place. You know, that was it. I never did anything. A book published by the Good Shepherd Nuns in 1943 describes the home as not only a refuge for those who have strayed from the right path, it is also a haven of safety for weak or unprotected souls. But Chaparral Bowman says it was a place where she was sexually abused by a visiting priest and where at age eight, she was put to work in the laundry alongside a woman called Henrietta Neither knew that they were actually mother and daughter. My mother was kept there for 15 years. And when I went to work in the laundry at eight, I didn't know she was my mother. She was just Henrietta. The laundry world Bowman describes sounds very much like the Irish version. Long hours, brutal work, and regular punishment for minor or imaginary offenses. Bed wedding was a big one. Um, not being on time, being out of line. Of course, I'd get sent to St. Peter's room. For these infractions, the punishment was often isolation. St. Peter's room was probably six feet long and maybe four feet wide. It was all boards. And when the door closed, it closed so that there was no, you, you couldn't see any light. You could be there for a week. That solitary confinement wasn't the only punishment. Bowman describes something called the basin. A nun and some of the other girls holding the punished girl's head in water. They got you on the floor and then the nun would grab you by the hair, put your face into that basin of water until you, you know, you stop fighting. Then she'd let you up, get some air and back down again. The Canadian laundries did not escape criticism. In 1927, the Toronto Telegram raged about one of them, saying, ostensibly a charity, it is a money-making laundry business where prison labor is employed in competition with legitimate laundry businesses. There is no wage given those who work in the laundry. We were slaves in that laundry. Chaparral Bowman says she ran away from the St. John Laundry at age 18. Decades later, she took the Good Shepherd nuns to court, seeking damages for years of alleged physical and sexual abuse. The nuns denied it, claiming that they'd given her an education and that she'd made it all up. The judge said I was of unsound mind and this could not happen in Canada, although I had a 15-day trial and 17 witnesses. A doctor who testified on her behalf differed, saying she was actually suffering from post-traumatic stress. My feeling is somebody owes my little mother something, and they owe me for those years. They do.
In Ireland, the survivors, more numerous than Canada, are demanding justice too. Maureen Sullivan and Maureen Taylor. I mean, it was slave labor, wasn't it? I'm entitled to get paid for the work and the suffering. I suffered as a young girl. Now, after centuries of silence and years of inaction, finally some movement on the Magdalene Laundrie's affair. Last year, the United Nations Committee Against Torture issued a scathing report calling for compensation for the victims of abuse and punishment for the perpetrators. In the wake of that, the Irish government appointed a limited inquiry. I think the religious bodies did, at a very difficult time in Irish history, provide a refuge for women who were uh, rejected by their own families and indeed rejected by local communities. Ireland's Justice Minister Alan Shatter claims there was some good done by the laundries, some women helped by the nuns. But when pressed about what should happen now in the cases of abuse claims, he chooses his words carefully. Is it at least a live issue, the possibility for apology, compensation? if the right information comes out. These are all issues ultimately for government to consider. The group that represents the nuns declined our request for an interview, offering instead a statement. This is a sad, complex, and dark story of Irish society that extends over 150 years. We are willing to participate in any initiative that will bring greater clarity, understanding, and justice for all the women involved. One of the few Irish churchmen who will speak publicly about the issue is Willie Walsh, now retired as the bishop of a diocese in the west of the country. A recognition that wrong, uh, serious wrong, has been done. I think we have as a society been in serious denial. Some of it was equivalent to slave labor, yes. But for this Canadian woman who says she was a slave too, there's nothing on the horizon. Both the Diocese of St. John and the Good Shepherd nuns refused our requests for interviews, and Federal Justice Minister Rob Nicholson declined to comment. Unlike Ireland, there will be no inquiry in Canada. It seems that whatever may have happened here just happened too long ago. Once you admit something, even a government admits something, they have to do something about it. The, the people would demand it, I think. In Ireland, Maureen Taylor and the rest await the report of the inquiry expected midsummer. But she already claims a personal victory. I'm a survivor, and uh, it, it's fantastic to be a survivor. I mean, this had been hanging over me for years. As I said, I was ashamed to tell anybody where I was. It was a shame. But now I know there was nothing to be ashamed of. not knowing what they're going to do to you. The horror always stays with you. It never leaves you. There's a part of your life that is destroyed. Maureen Taylor and Maureen Sullivan call themselves survivors. Survivors of a peculiar institution called the Magdalene Laundries. They did. They did wreck my life. They destroyed it. I, my first uh, marriage, I couldn't cope. I wasn't able to cope. And my husband, he's, he's dead as well. The Lord have mercy on him. He couldn't understand why I'd be waking up in the night. I was ashamed. I had never told anybody I was in the Magdalene Laundries because I felt that you were a bad person. In the Christian tradition, Mary Magdalene was the fallen woman who repented to become among the most faithful followers of Jesus. Starting in the 18th century, orders of nuns throughout Europe opened houses in her name where they tried to convince prostitutes to leave the street. By the 20th century in Ireland, they had a broader mission, taking in unwed mothers and often young women who were simply not wanted by their families. When Maureen's here in Canada. They say they were the forgotten ones, their names taken away, their freedom denied, 
their humanity abused. It's a disgrace. Absolutely, the church was a disgrace. Well, you'd wake up sort of maybe three o'clock in the morning uh, screaming because the nuns used to come in and check on you in that time. You always visioned them around your bed, you know, in their dark clothes. The notion of slave labor in the Western world seems like a point of history to most. But as recently as 15 years ago, women who were cast aside by society were sent to institutions in Ireland run by the church. Those institutions became known as the Magdalen Laundries for the hard, unpaid labor the women endured doing industrial laundry. Today, there is a movement afoot to right those wrongs of the past. Sean Mallon traveled to Ireland to hear the women's stories and in the process uncovered a troubling parallel. Sullivan was only 12 years old. Her mother sent her to what was known as an industrial school. This after Sullivan was abused by a family member. But that lovely school turned out to be a Magdalen laundry to do work every day. Instead of an education, every day Sullivan says she was taken down a dark, dank passageway to a building next door and put to work. It was just, you know, it was sticky, sweaty. It was just horrible. Four orders of Catholic nuns ran the ten laundries around Ireland. The women say the labor was relentless, injuries common.